Pam, and good morning, everyone. You know, um, when you have a Pentecostal worship service where nobody can touch each other, it gets wonky, doesn't it? So here's what I want us to do. Everybody put your hands together and give each other a big round of applause. Come on. That's right. We're glad you're here. It's a great crowd this morning. It's a great crowd. And uh, we have so many people watching online. Tim has already welcomed them. I just got a text from a friend of mine who pastors a Baptist church, and they uh, had to cancel their service this morning, so he's tuned in here. And uh, so for my friend Danny and for all the rest who are watching online, let's give them a big round of applause, too. We're delighted you're here. I know that we have a lot of guests. If you're, if you're a guest in the house this morning, this is not your usual place of worship, would you just raise your hand? Wow, so many. That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. If you came to hear Pastor Travis, he is the cool young guy with the anointing. He'll be back next week. I'm the old guy with the cufflinks. But uh, you'll want to be back next Sunday to hear Pastor Travis. He's such a blessed uh, preacher, and he will bring us uh, stories of God's wonderful work in Ghana. He, this is his annual trip to Ghana or to Thailand. He goes once a year either to Ghana or to Thailand to check on the girls' homes and with the churches. Travis has 35 churches in West Africa in five different countries. And at this trip, he brings all of those pastors in, and they have a pastor's conference then he presides over a meeting of all of the administrators and teachers at the school. We have a school there that's about 450 students, so he meets with all the teachers and administrators, and, and then the local staff there in Ghana, he meets with them. So uh, Travis gets his work in pretty well when he's in Ghana. Now, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, please, to the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter, Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to be reading this morning from the King James Version because there is a, a translation um, bobble in some of the modern translations. One of the words that's in the KJV is inexplicably left out in most of the modern versions. And it's an important word, and it's actually the word I want to zero in on. So I know there are a lot of different translations, but... Uh, you know, when I was at the university as a president, they used, the kids used to ask me, Dr. Rutland, how come you always read from the King James Bible? So I, I would say to them, well, part of it was loyalty. I, I went to high school with King James. And <laughs> Jimmy, we called him Jimmy. He wasn't a king in high school. The other part is the, all of the these and thous that offend everybody else that Shakespearean sound feels good to my creative heart. I, I like it. I, the modern versions, I can't get used to Jesus walking down to the Sea of Galilee and saying, it's happening, dudes. It's, it's just me. It's just me. So uh, I'm going to read from King James. It's no big religious thing. You don't have to have a King James Bible to go to heaven, okay? One will be given you when you get there. <laughs> but why stand in that long, embarrassing line? <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm always afraid somebody will take it seriously. Amen, brother. I'm just teasing. No, no, just joking. I'm going to read from King James. You follow me in whatever cheap communist imitation you've got. <laughs> you know, with all this virus thing going on, everybody seemed like you were uptight. I thought we'd lighten it up. All right, now we'll get back to it. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died. Now let's pause a moment as we read. Uzziah, the king, not to be confused with Isaiah, the prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, here's the word missing in your version, if you're not reading KJV, also. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train, the, the robe of his garment, the train of his robe, filled the temple. And above it, that is the throne, above it stood the seraphim. By the way, it's the only place in the whole Bible that this word is mentioned. 
And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. And with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door, in other words, the, the, the foundation of the temple, moved at the voice of him that cried, Him, the angels. If, if the temple shakes at the voice of angels, what if God should speak? So at this point, we have not heard the voice of God. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King. Make note of it. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. In honor of our pastor who's in Ghana, I'd like to pray this morning in the language there, in tree, the language of the Ashanti. So bow your head and let's pray. Momanye on bompaye, let us pray. Onyami, medawa sipa, medao, wuna wuye kron kron, wuna wuye fe 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 pa, wuna wuye me konche fo, medasi, medawa sipa. Lord, I praise you, I thank you, and we love you. We love you because you're holy. We love you because you are beautiful beyond compare. Fairest of 10,000. And we love you because you guide us even in the darkest night and in the most desperate storm. We thank you for it. In the wonderful name, Jesus. Why, Yesu de Nemon. In the name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen and amen. There are those events politically and historically that seem to rise up and claim for themselves the authority to name our year. Um, I remember uh, exactly where I was. I'm, I'm probably the oldest person in the room here. This is a youthful church, but, but I remember exactly where I was in Mrs. Kovacs' civics class in Damascus, Maryland High School when the principal's voice came over the loudspeaker and he said, please let me have your attention. I have the responsibility to inform you that President Kennedy has been shot dead in Dallas, Texas. I'll never forget that moment. I could take you to the desk I was sitting in if that high school still existed. I remember where I was, exactly where I was the day that Dr. King was shot dead off of a balcony of a motel in Memphis, Tennessee. I, I remember when Columbine entered the functional vocabulary of American culture, and we learned that our high schools could become killing fields in a moment. All except the very youngest of you here know where you were when the phrase 9-11 took on a new significance. And we learned that our culture and our country and our civilization had a target on its back and that there were people who hated us with a murderous rage simply for who we were and for what we believe. There are also those personal moments that rise up and seem to claim the right to name a year. The year that you got married. The year that you got your first job. The year that you got fired. The year the first baby came. The year when he finally moved out of the house. <laughs> those, things, those things are part of our humanity, both corporately and individually. How human it is, how wonderfully human that Isaiah, the dean of all the prophets, in the year that he is given the most probably the most flamboyant, most extravagant vision of divinity ever afforded a human being. He dates it 
with a contemporary political event. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. This uh, Isaiah chapter 6 is what is called Isaiah's call report. All of the prophets had a call report. That is exactly what it sounds like. It's the report of how they were called from whatever they were doing into the office of a prophet. And Isaiah, who was a priest, he's in the temple at this time. He is called out of the office of priest and into the office of prophet. And this is his call report. His, the most, the biggest moment of his life and the greatest, most, most magnificent, resplendent vision probably ever given a human being until the, until the Mount of Transfiguration. And yet, he dates it to a contemporary political event. How like us, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Now, here's the question. Why did God appear to him in that moment in that way? Why did he appear as a king? God is God. He can appear as a purple unicorn if he wants to. How, he appeared to Moses through a burning bush, a column of fire, a, a pillar of smoke, uh, a, a dove. God can appear in any way he wants. Why a king on a throne in that moment? The verse itself tells us, in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah was a king who came to the throne of Israel with great hope and expecta expectation. He was young and attractive and winsome. He reopened temple worship. He was a patron of the priesthood. Isaiah loved him because he, he reestablished the priesthood and, and he began to have uh, military success where Israel had been failing in the past. He extended the borders. He built new military garrisons. There was a socioeconomic resurgence, an actual um, revival financially. Then at the peak of his career, in the arrogancy of his heart, Uzziah, not content to be a king, also wanted to insinuate himself into the priesthood. So he tried to force his way into the temple to, to do the duties of the priesthood. And the legitimate priests, obviously, of course, resisted him. And they said, no, your majesty, don't do this. And Uzziah was so angry that God struck him in his face with leprosy. And he lived the rest of his life with leprosy and then died. He has just died in this passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, he doesn't fill in the blank, in the year that King Uzziah finally died with leprosy. I've tried to come up with a, a corollary of contemporary America of what, what that might mean for the king to have leprosy. And, and the example I've come up with is probably not a good one. It's just the best I can find right now. We, we, we know leprosy is a viral disease which can be treated with medicine. But at that time, leprosy was considered an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual curse. That the hand of God was against this person and the leprosy was proof of that. So if the hand of God is against the king, if the king is cursed then what about the whole nation? Imagine, if you will, that some president someday goes on international television and announces that he is dying with AIDS. Not from a medical mishap or a blood transfusion, but from his lifestyle. Think how humiliated we would be. Think of the national embarrassment. That's how Israel felt. That's uh, that ambassadors would come from foreign countries and say, we'd like to meet with the king. And somebody had to say to them, no, you can't meet with King Uzziah. He's, he's got leprosy. It was a, a national humiliation. Now he has died. And Isaiah, pacing up and down in the temple that night, is feeling all of the, the conflict of emotions inside of himself, all the riot of opposing emotions that we deal with in our own personal intersections. It's what we have to deal with all the time, Pastor, at, at uh, funerals. So when Grandpa finally dies with Alzheimer's after a long and lingering disease, there, there's all these things that race inside of us. On the one hand, we feel a sense of relief. 
Thank God that's over. It, thank God it's over for him. Thank God it's over for all of us. It was a drain on the family. It was a drain financially. It, it, we're all exhausted. But the moment you get in touch with the fact of that relief, you're overwhelmed with guilt. You say, what's the matter with me? Am I glad my grandfather's dead? Then you begin to think, now that grandpa's gone, maybe things will get better. Then you think, wait a minute, grandpa was the linchpin. He was the patriarch of this whole family. If he died with, if he dies with Alzheimer's, maybe things will get worse. That's what Isaiah is dealing with. King Uzziah's dead. In a sense, he's relieved. That's over. That national scandal, that embarrassment is finished. However, if the last king died with leprosy, the next king might be good, he might be better, but oh, what if he's worse? What if things get worse? He's struggling with all of that. When all of a sudden, in the wide expanse of the temple up over his head, he is given this phenomenal vision of God as a king. He says, as a king, seated upon a throne, and these angels, these seraphic beings, these are not the limp-wristed, golden-haired, effeminate creatures you hang on your Christmas tree. These are terrifying angels, six wings, who shout to each other across the expanse of the temple, holy, 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 until this angelic echo shakes the temple. And the whole temple is filled with the smoke as of a, some kind of supernatural incense. And there is God seated up on the throne as a king. And the train, the robe of his garment in resplendent glory flows down through the, through the air. Why does he appear in that form at that moment to that man? Don't you see? He's saying, I know you think the king of Israel is dead. But the king of heaven is alive. He's saying, I know you feel grief and that you're stricken with fear for the future because the throne of Israel is empty, but the throne of heaven is occupied. We have a king in glory that will not die, cannot be corrupted, cannot leave us, will not disappoint us, will never disillusion us, and he is seated on high in glory. Now that's the vision that he gives him. He's saying, look, I'm not going anywhere, and I'm never, ever going to disillusion you. I can't be corrupted. I can't be bribed. I'm not going to do anything inappropriate. I'm the king in glory, surrounded by angels who worship my holiness. You know, when, when we get that kind of a vision of God high and lifted up, it, it brings us into balance with all of these historical things. Look, this thing that we are facing now in this country, as terrible as it is, I'm, please do not hear me, I'm not making light of it for one moment. What I'm saying is that it, the vision of God as king transcendent brings those things into, into balance for us. Look, sometimes I think Christians love scary stories. I, I do. I think sometimes we get addicted to, well, like go and sit in a dark theater for a scary movie with your popcorn and your Coke and say, come on, scare the liver out of me. <laughs> and I think sometimes we get addicted to this stuff. There's no, probably nobody here that can even remember 1988. You're all too young. But in 1988, this nincompoop wrote this book. Anybody remember? 88 reasons Jesus is coming in 1988. He sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And you know, this is what disillusions you about the ministry. People that I preach to, people in my church lost their minds. One lady came to me and she said, well, on Tuesday, I'm keeping the kids home from school. I said, why? She said, pastor, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I said, well, why are you keeping the kids home? She stared at me like I was speaking Russian. She said, pastor, if Jesus is coming on Tuesday, I don't want the kids at school. I said, he knows where your children go to school. He can find your kids. Well, Jesus didn't come in 1988, did he? 1989. What do you think that boy did? Oh, oh, yes, he did. 
Oh, yes, he did. He wrote another one. 89 reasons Jesus is coming in 89. He didn't sell quite as many, but he sold a lot. Sometimes I wonder when the entire evangelical world sinks into the grave, if the headstone won't read hook, line, and sinker. (laughs) Or if you don't remember that one, how about this one? Y2K. Did the American church freak out? Remember Y2K? The planes are all going to fall out of the sky. The banks will fail. It's the end of Western civilization. People left their homes, left their jo- quit their jobs, buried gold in the backyard, stockpiled green beans and bought guns. Nobody's going to get my green beans till they pry my cold, dead fingers off. I, no, I've got a couple of questions. Were you really going to shoot anybody for those beans? Here's what never seemed to occur. We're Christians. Didn't it ever occur to anybody to, like, share the beans? Well, Y2K was a bust. Okay, we're facing this now. It's real. I'm not making light of it. But I do want to say to you, sometimes I think we get the idea that we enjoy the thrill. We enjoy the agony, the, the energy over it. I'm not, I don't want to make arrogant and presumptuous statements about any affliction. We are not, as Christians, we are not impervious to history. We're not impervious to any affliction. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is we are impervious to panic. We are impervious to panic. What, what, what is up with the toilet paper? What, no, what, what is that about? People busting a cap in each other in the Walmart for toilet paper. Listen, has anybody told you this is not gastrointestinal flu? Now see... You do not use toilet paper on your lungs. I'm just saying. When we get a vision of the glory and grandeur of God, that he is above, higher, holier, untouched, unblemished, it makes, it makes us to realize history is not happening to God. His, God doesn't. God doesn't pick up the newspaper in the morning to find out what's going on. Whoa, whoa. I wasn't expecting that. (laughs) I'm going to have to have a meeting with some angels to figure this sucker out. You you remember the seven seals on the scroll in the book of Revelation? Remember that no man can open them. And John the Revelator weeps because he wants to see them move forward. And the angel says, no, don't, don't be afraid. The line of the tribe of Judah will open those seals. Those seals are the the movement forward, the epochs of human history as they unfold one after the other. But those seals don't pop off at random like the buttons off a fat man's coat. They only open as Jesus opens them by divine decree. History is not happening to God. It's unfolding in the palm of his hand. That, that restores our sense of balance. That's why people can say to us, how can you be at peace? Don't you see? Don't you see what's happening in the stock market? Don't you see what's happening? Don't you see this? Don't you see that? Al-Qaeda, ISIS, don't you see that? Elections. Look, elections are important. I'm, before God, I'm not making light of the republic. I'm just saying half of the country terrified that one person's going to be elected. The other half just as terrified that this person's going to be elected. And I'm just trying to say to you, don't freak out over these things. So people say, how can you be at peace? How come you're so calm? Don't you see these things? You say, yes, I see them. He did. Isaiah doesn't say Uzziah was asleep. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Faith is not denial. Faith is not denial. We face the truth. We see reality. We see what everybody else sees. They say, don't you see these things? You say, yes, I see them. 
They said, well, how do you stay calm? Because I also see the Lord and he's high and lifted up. So we live in the world. We live amidst all of these things. We're, they're part of our lives, but we don't have to live in fear of these things. We don't have to live in panic. The next thing is this. When we see God high and lifted up like that, by faith, it restores our sense of depth perception. What is, what is really big? What is really important? When I was a kid, child, right at the end of the Civil War, Oh, it hurts me when you laugh at me. <laughs> but I, I didn't go to a fun, exciting church like Restoration with a good children's ministry and all that. We didn't have children's ministry in those days. Anybody remember? You just went to church, sat in a pew, and you kept your mouth shut. And my mother, my mother is 96 years old. She's five feet tall. And my mother defied all the rules of physics. How could she sit on one end of a nine-foot pew and I on the other, and if I misbehaved, how could she pinch me without moving? <laughs> so you just sat in church and you learned how to entertain yourself. And it was in those, I'm trying to think of a nice word. No, I can't. It's just boring. Uh, excruciatingly boring little Methodist churches. I learned depth perception. There was a big cut glass chandelier that hung right up in the top of the auditorium. And I learned that I could make my thumb bigger than that chandelier. Now, I want you to do this. Just humble yourself. Come on. Be a sport, okay? I want you to extend your right arm if you can and lift your thumb up like that. Come on. Just do it for me. And close one eye. Now, look up at these screens. There's no way that your thumb could ever be bigger than one of those screens. Now, slowly, carefully, Draw your thumb closer to your open eye. Come on, closer, closer, closer. Now, right against your eye. It's a miracle. <laughs> you have made your thumb bigger than that screen. That is exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to take things in life and history and humanity and press them right up against your face until they block the light and say, there, that's bigger than God. That's bigger than the king. And, and bring that sense, that spirit of darkness and abandon us, upon us. But the reality is he is high and lifted up. We don't, have, we don't, don't argue with your adversary. When Satan says to you, do you see that? Do you see how terrible this is? Say, yes, I see it. But I also see the Lord. And he's high and lifted up. The third thing that it does, it restores our self-understanding. The moment Isaiah sees God for who he is, he sees Isaiah for who he is. He says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. When we see God in his holiness, we become deeply, profoundly aware of our own humanity. You ever see these uh, movie stars, usually arrogant agnostics movie stars, who, who are being interviewed and they often ask them this same question. I hear it all the time. If you, when you see God, when you get to heaven, what are you going to ask God? Of course, getting to heaven is a presupposition. But when you get to heaven, what are you going to ask God? And they always have these questions. You ever hear this one? I've got some things I'm going to ask God. I've got some things. I'm going to ask him about genocide. I'm just going to ask God. I'm going to ask God about disease and affliction and war. I'm going I'm to ask God as if we're going to hold God accountable for the disasters that we create. Let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, you won't ask God anything. I, I have some questions. I do have some questions. Don't you? I'd like to know why Adult males. Guys, am I right about it? I'd just like to know why, as we get older, our hair falls out of our head and grows in our ears. I'd... Was that part of the plan? I'd just like to understand that. But the fact of the matter is, 
When you are ushered into the throne room of heaven, walking on golden streets, and the throngs of heaven stretch in every direction, singing the music of the spheres, and the eyes in your glorified body are trying to adjust to the brilliance of a sunless sky, and you see Almighty God seated upon his throne with the rainbow over, and the angels, and the archangels, and the voice of God, like 10,000 waterfalls, says, any questions? You're going to say... I'm just happy to be here. (laughs) No questions. When Isaiah becomes deeply and profoundly aware of his own sinfulness and the sinfulness of the generation in which he lives, in the the light of that, he cries out, woe is me. What was me? There is something, isn't there, about us. The closer we get to God, there is something that we say, oh, God, I'm not, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. But God doesn't abandon Isaiah there. Look at what happens. It's a fascinating little passage of scripture. It says an angel comes with a coal, a live coal from off of the altar in his hand. Now watch this, that he took off of the altar with tongs. Now that's a complicated little mechanical thing there. If he, the coal can't be too hot for the angel to hold, he's got it in his hand. So why does he lift it off of the altar with tongs, transfer it to his hand and hold it? Why, why is it? It's because the altar of God is so holy that not even an angel will run the risk of touching it. But the lips of sinful sinful humanity are so fragile that he doesn't want us to get the mechanical touch. He wants that personal touch of sanctifying grace. So he lifts the the coal off with the tongue, transfers it to his hand, and flies toward Isaiah. Think of that moment. That angel with a live coal off of the holy altar of God is coming closer and closer and closer to you. Think about that. As it comes closer and closer, that must have been a breathtaking moment. I have a friend, uh, a rabbi in Jerusalem, and I ask him about this passage where it says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. I said, as a, as a rabbi, what do you think of? He said, the most unclean thing I can think of is pig's blood. He said, so he says, it's as if I have pig's blood smeared across my mouth. And I look around and everybody else has it, too. And this angel is coming closer and closer. It must have been breathtaking. Closer, closer, closer. And then, and the angel says, you thought it was going to kill you. And all it did was cure you. You thought it was going to harm you. And all it did was sanctify you. As we get closer and closer to God, we become more and more aware of who we are. And then God's grace and sanctifying mercy comes to cleanse us. So far in this story, God has not spoken. It's just been between Isaiah and the angels. Now, sanctified, cleansed by God's grace. It's an amazing thing. God touches, sends the angel with the coal to touch Isaiah's mouth and his ears are opened. Suddenly, he can hear the voice of God. And it's not God booming out. It's as though Isaiah is in the hallway outside God's office. And God is inside, pacing up and down, and he's not really talking to Isaiah. He's just like walking up and down. Who will I send? Who can go for us? Whom whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I need somebody. I need somebody. Now, for the first moment, we don't know. Maybe God was saying that the whole time, but Isaiah couldn't hear him. Now, suddenly, God's opened, has touched his lips. He's cleansed, cleansed lips. Now his ears are open. He hears God. And he says in the English Bible, here am I, Lord, send me. However, in Hebrew, it's a little different. In Hebrew, it sounds, see, that sounds, in English, it sounds like the second string quarterback going up and down the sidelines, tugging on the coach. Send me in, coach. Come on, send me in. Let me, let me run plays. Come on, let me go in. But in Hebrew, it's more like this. Here I stand. Look me over 
and see if I'll do. Is there any way you can use me? Now look, don't you see how the picture all comes together? We see historical events. We see the realities. We see the plagues and problems of humanity. All the stuff we're dealing with. But we also see God. And he is high and lifted up and he's holy. And he reminds us of our sinfulness. And then he sends the redemptive reality that touches us and cleanses us. And then we're open, now open to hear the voice of God who is concerned about the humanity around us. And he now engages us when we live and walk in fear of the historical realities in which we live. We cannot hear God and we cannot hear the needs of humanity around us. When suddenly God restores our depth perception, we see God high and lifted up and we hear his voice of compassion. We say, Lord, I'm not going to withdraw from sinful humanity. I want to go there. I want to go there. You know, one of the things I always admire about first responders, the cops and people like that, is that when there's gunfire, I mean, if they do what they're trained to do and they're good at it, when there's gunfire, they don't get under the chair. They run toward the sound of the gunfire. They run toward it. That's the way the church is supposed to be. That's what the church is supposed to say. In times of stress and disaster and emotional and spiritual fatigue when the nation just everybody around us is in fear then we said we're here God send me into the midst of this I've seen you high and lifted up you've cleansed me of my iniquity you've opened my ears to hear your compassion for the sinful world that see that's that's why your pastor is in Africa isn't it you could say, you could say, we got plenty of problems right here. We got, we got plenty going on. You could say to your pastor, isn't there anybody, there's nobody lost in all of Georgia? You have to go to Africa? But, but he's saying to you, this church has heard the cries of the world. This church is open to the voice of God and to the summons. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And that's when we humble ourselves. Lord, I've seen you. I've seen you high and lifted up. And all my fear is gone. Is there any way you can use me? Let me close with this. When I was a young person in my 20s just starting in missions, I believe it was uh, during Lincoln's second term, I believe, so I met a retired Presbyterian missionary who was in a nursing home in Atlanta. He was in his 90s. So I'm now 72. So 50 years ago, I met a man who was in his 90s. Think now how long ago he was a missionary in his 20s. In those days, you didn't make a two-week mission trip in an airplane. You went someplace and you stayed and you stayed there. You died there until you stayed till your denomination brought you home and let you die in a nursing home in the United States, which is exactly what the Presbyterian Church was doing for him. But I spent a lot of time with this old dude. I just loved him, and he had so many stories, and he inspired me about my unfolding missionary work. But one thing I'll never forget. He told me he was sent by the church to Southeast Asia. He said he always had a longing. We, we, we didn't know what to call this till Hollywood told us. It's called a bucket list. Thank God for Hollywood. So... <laughs> So he said he had a, a longing always to see Mount Everest. He said, I don't know where it came from. Maybe I saw it in an encyclopedia or something. But he said, I just always had a longing to see Mount Everest. I don't even know where it came from. And he said, but I knew it would never happen. I didn't have any money. I couldn't get to Nepal. I couldn't do that. He said, then out of the blue, he got an opportunity to attend a missions conference in Munich, Germany, all expenses paid. And he had an extra day, and he had saved some money, so he flew to Nepal, and he was going to get to see Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. But as God would have it, when his plane landed in Nepal, the whole subcontinent was engulfed with a virtually impenetrable fog bank. He said when he landed, he couldn't see the terminal. 
So he just got off, told the guy who met him in the airport, I'm just going to go on to Munich. This is stupid. And the guy had said, it's bigger than you think. He said he complained and griped and murmured the whole trip. He said they got on a train, then they got on a Land Rover. Finally, they got off and walked up some mountain trail where the guy, I don't know what's to some viewing platform or something. I don't know what it was. Some place where they could see the great mountain better than any place else. But he said as they walked up the trail, he was holding on to the guide's coattail and murmuring. He said, this is, this is stupid. I can't even see my hand in front of my face. He said the guide just kept saying the same thing. It's bigger than you think. Finally, he engineered him out to this one place and said, now, look. And the old man told me he peered through the pea soup of the fog and he said against the distant horizon, he thought he could make out one mountain just a little taller than the others. And he said, there. He said, I think I see it. He said the guide laughed, came around behind him and took hold of his head and said, not down there. He said, look up there. <laughs> That's one of the sweetest ministries of the Holy Spirit is whether it is in the face of some national calamity or some historical plague or at the grave of a loved one, the Holy Spirit comes behind us with feathered fingers and lifts our eyes up. And he says, not down there, my child. Look up there. He's high and lifted up. Praise his holy name. Magnify the Lord. Now will you bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I praise you for your word. And I thank you, God, that you lift our eyes above the horizons of this present age. And our fear is vanquished. Fear is swallowed up. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you say, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? If the truth were known, I'm just going to humble myself. I've really been under attack of fear lately. Will you just... Pray for me that it'll be vanquished and that God will fill me with faith in his place. Yes, yes, yes. It's dark now, so raise your hand high if you don't mind. And then you can take it right back down. Sure, sure. Yes, okay. So many, so many. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. It's, it's a constant attack on us. Satan wants to make us afraid. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will open our eyes that we may see you high and lifted up. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and that with our eyes on you, we can state with faith, I am not afraid. I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing it together. Come on. I'm no longer. Well, I'm no longer Lift a your hands slave up. to fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Come on, lift your hands and magnify the Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Well, I'm no longer. Now just hold a minute. Now just hold a minute. Listen. Take out the word fear if that's not your issue. And put in any word. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to drugs. I'm no longer a slave to pain. I'm no longer a slave to hurt. Whatever it is, put that word in. Put that word in as we sing it again. Now I just want to say to those that are watching online, right where you are, unless you're driving your car. Why don't you lift your hands up too and let's sing together. I'm no longer a slave. Come on. Well, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yes, I am a child of God. I'm no longer. I'm no longer. Never again. Never again. A slave to fear. Satan will not hold me. Fear will not grip me. One more time. Oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am.
Let's sing it. Let's sing it one time, just the voices, Luke. Let's sing just the voices one time. Let your voice, let Satan hear your voice. Tell him. Put him on notice. We don't cower before the enemy. Stand him, look him in the eye. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Let's sing it together, just the voices. Come on. One time. Well, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child of God. Praise God in this house. Magnify the Lord. Go on and praise Him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Now look right up here and we'll have a closing prayer and you're dismissed. And as you leave, <laughs> and now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to stand you before his own presence without fault and with unspeakable joy to the only wise God, our Savior, King of glory, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before time began right now and throughout all the ages to come and when the battle's over we'll all wear a crown god bless you everybody god bless you